I'm uh, starting with this um, photograph of Wright arriving at the San Francisco airport in 1957, which I found in the um, San Francisco Chronicles photo archive, because I love the fact that he looks uh, so vigorous and uh, energetic only about a month before his uh, 90th birthday. Also, I'd like to imagine that his evident good spirits here were due to his pleasure in coming back once more to this city that he genuinely enjoyed being in, as we know from his correspondence and interviews. Well, first, let me mention how I got involved in this subject of Frank Lloyd Wright's work in the San Francisco area. During the um, years that I taught the history of architecture at Stanford, one of the courses I gave was a seminar on Wright. And we would take field trips to his buildings in the Bay Area, such as his uh, wonderful shop on Maiden Lane here in the, in the city, um, uh, just off of Union Square. Originally, the V.C. Morris shop. And I'll say more about uh, uh, this building later. <coughs> And this got me interested, especially in Wright's projects designed for the Bay Area, both the built and the unbuilt projects. And I started doing research on the topic. More recently, when I would tell people that I was writing a book on Wright's um, Bay Area works, a common response was, well, wh what is there? There's the uh, Marin County Civic Center, people would point out, and, and San Rafael and that shop on Maiden Lane that we just saw, and a few houses, but is that really enough for a book? That was sometimes what people would tell me. And they were always surprised when I told them that in fact, Wright designed roughly 30 projects for the Bay Area, although only about a third of them were actually built. And I'll uh, say something later about why uh, so many of them were not built. Here's a, uh, a map that I created showing the locations of all of these uh, uh, projects. You probably can't see the numbers there, but there are numbers for, uh, number for each of the projects, and they correspond uh, to a uh, list next to the map in the, in the book. Moreover, these projects include some of Wright's most unusual and innovative designs. For example, his first design for a skyscraper of 1913, the Call Building, was to be on uh, Market Street, Market and Fourth Streets, here in the city. And even though it wasn't constructed, it was one of Wright's favorite designs. And he built a couple of large models of it, one of which we see here on the, uh, on the right, which he kept behind his drafting table at Taliesin, his home and studio in uh, Wisconsin. If built, this uh, would have been the tallest building west of Chicago at this time, and um, it was uh, also one of the most uh, advanced skyscraper designs of that, uh, of that time. Another of Wright's uh, Bay Area projects was a, a very unusual mortuary complex of 1947, the Daphne Funeral Chapels, to be at Church and DuBose Streets here in the city, next to the San Francisco Mint, which we see in this, um, in this uh, drawing by Wright, one of Wright's drawings of the project. And we see, of course, up at the top here, there's the San Francisco Mint, which you're probably familiar with, up just off of Market Street near DuBose. And when, um, when Wright first went to the site and asked uh, Mr. Daphne what the large building was up in the, on the rock, and Daphne said it was the San Francisco Mint, Wright said, we'll make the mint look like a morgue and, the, and your morgue look like a mint. <laughs> and also another one of his uh, projects for the Bay Area, a small Christian science church for Bolinas in Marin County of 1956. Again, not uh, never built and an amazing industrial plant and uh, company headquarters for San Carlos on the peninsula, also of the mid-50s, which would have been Wright's largest structure if it had been built. Using the uh, structural system, Wright had created 
in the 1930s for the Johnson Administration Building in uh, Racine, Wisconsin, with these innovative uh, and remarkably slender lily pad columns, as they're sometimes called. <coughs> and a fanciful wedding chapel commissioned by the Claremont Hotel in the Berkeley, Oakland Hills. And various structures for the Marin County Fairgrounds adjacent to the Civic Center, including a fair pavilion, uh, which we see at the top there with a tent-like roof suspended on cables and an amphitheater. And an amazing reinforced concrete bridge for the San Francisco Bay that Wright called the Butterfly Bridge, which he started working on in 1949, though he never actually received the commission for it from the, the state. And later I'll say more about this project also. And some of Wright's house projects for the Bay Area were also extremely innovative. For example, the Hannah House of 1937 at Stanford was the first time that he was able to talk a client into constructing a type of building he had been thinking about for, for a number of years with a plan based totally on non-rectangular geometry, in this case the hexagon. And we can see here, if you can see the plan clearly enough, that, um, that there are no right angles in the plan at all. It's totally uh, 60 and 100 degree angles based on a, um, on a hexagon grid. And as a result, uh, Wright sometimes called this the um, honeycomb house. And he did this really as a, as a furtherance of his desire to break open the box, as he put it, of conventional architecture. And as I say, this was the first time that he had uh, found a client willing to, to build uh, a, a structure uh, with this uh, non-rectangular geometry. And this really inaugurated an important characteristic of Wright's later work, the use of non-rectangular geometry such as triangles, hexagons and uh, circles. Another house uh, in the Bay Area that's uh, of interest, the Burger House in San Anselmo in Marin County is unusual for a, for a different reason. The man who commissioned it, Bob Berger, a teacher, constructed it for his family totally by himself. And as a result, it took him nearly 20 years to, uh, to build probably the longest construction job of any of Wright's uh, buildings. And the construction was especially difficult uh, for Berger because Wright had given him a design using what he called desert masonry construction. And this um, required um, building forms. And in the next slide here we see photographs taken at different times of Bob Berger working on this uh, house over the years, photographs uh, taken by his uh, family and a couple of his sons were kind enough to, uh, um, to give me these uh, photographs. And so up at the top here we see him building the, uh, uh, the forms for these, um, for these walls and then uh, splitting large stones. And we see him doing that over, over here uh, to give them more or less flat surfaces, then placing them in the forms in such a way that when the concrete is poured and the forms removed, the stones are visible on the surface of the walls. Wright had uh, first used this kind of construction at Taliesin West, his uh, winter home and studio in uh, Arizona in the 1930s. And the, uh, the Burger House is unusual for another reason. It's uh, Wright's only house for which he also designed a separate structure for the family dog at the request of one of Berger's sons. So it's Wright's only dog house. And among Wright's um, unconstructed house projects for the Bay Area are a couple of his most spectacular designs, such as this one designed in 1945 for Lillian and V.C. Morris, the people who commissioned the shop on Maiden Lane the house being directly on the ocean in the Seacliff neighborhood of uh, San Francisco on, uh, on Camino del Mar, if you're familiar with that, uh, 
that area uh, down below uh, Lincoln Park. The uh, design was so unusual and, and the site so precipitous right on the cliffside there that it turned out to be too difficult or expensive to uh, construct. Wright then came up with some other designs for this site, such as another one here, um, a, a, almost equally uh, amazing and dramatic, but none of them got built, even though the Morrises loved the designs, especially the, uh, the first one. Well, another interesting thing about Wright's projects for the Bay Area is that they range over virtually his entire career. The first one, for a small house in Oakland, dates from around uh, 1900, almost at the beginning of his career, just as he was starting to develop his prairie house style in the Chicago area, which you may be uh, familiar with. Some of his most famous uh, buildings date from that um, prairie house period. And this is a mysterious design, uh, which I'm uh, sorry is a little hard to see here. I've, I took three. Uh, uh, details from the design uh, that are all on, on one um, rather large sheet of paper that was discovered in Wright's studio following his death. And there's no other information about this uh, design. It doesn't even identify the, uh, the client's name on the drawing or the address in uh, Oakland. It, but it does say down at the bottom, Dwelling for Oakland, California, Frank Lloyd Wright, Architect, Chicago, Illinois. Partly based on uh, that, uh, the fact that he, when he had his office in Chicago, and also based on uh, the style of dr the drawing and even more on the uh, style of the, of the design of the house, it's clear that it uh, has to date from about 1900. This uh, house uh, really, uh, we, we see here in a sense the beginning of the, of the prairie house style, of his development of the prairie house style with an emphasis, oops, I didn't want to move ahead, I wanted to use my light pointer here to uh, point out the um, uh, horizontal, emphasis on the horizontal with hipped roofs, uh, windows banked together to uh, create openings in the upper part of the wall. And one a very strange detail, it's probably a little hard for you to see, but the floor plan is composed of, of, of two squares that are overlapped or intersect something very uh, kind of unprecedented at the time, but something that Wright was playing with at the beginning uh, and to develop this idea of more fluid and uh, more complex uh, planning types. And there are other uh, details in this design which show that it um, has to date from just around uh, 1900, just at the beginning of his career. So we have a, and it's the, um, the earliest uh, design by Wright for uh, any location uh, really west of, uh, west of the Middle West. Uh, and um, so we have uh, one of Wright's uh, earliest uh, designs here in the Bay Area, N not built as far as we know. The other interesting thing is that it's not known whether this was ever built, so conceivably it, it was, but we, since we don't know the address and or the client's name, we really don't know. And I've had a couple of um, people in the Oakland planning office who've been helping me to try to uh, learn more about, uh, uh, see if we can find anything about this um, this mysterious project. And um, and at the end of Wright's career are several of uh, his Bay Area projects, such as the Marin County Civic Center, which we saw before. Here's one of his uh, overall drawings for the Civic Center, which he began working on in uh, 1957, but was still designing when he died in uh, 59. And in fact, one of Wright's very last commissions uh, uh, that he received was just before his death in uh, April 1959. And it was for a church in San Francisco, the Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church, which was to be on Brotherhood Way in the uh, southwest uh, part of the city. He was just beginning to sketch out his ideas for the project, and we see some of these sketches here. Um, just a few days before he died at the age of 91 in April of uh, 59. And as sketchy as these uh, uh, are, they show Wright approaching this design in a fresh and uh, innovative way to the extent that I've been able to sort of decipher what, what he had in mind in these, um, in these sketches, uh, even at his uh, advanced age and in um, uh, failing health.
I think it's best for me to take questions after the after the talk. Th but thank you. I want to uh, I want to entertain your question. Um, when I began working on the uh, book and decided to include Wright's unbuilt projects as well as the constructed ones, I realized that people might wonder why so many of them were not built. As I mentioned, only about a third of the projects were constructed. Here's, I'll show one more of the un unconstructed uh, house projects, the Hargrove House in uh, Orinda, for Orinda, which would have been one of Wright's most uh, impressive uh, houses. And since there's that stereotype about Wright that you may have heard stories about, that he was difficult to deal with and um, uh, sometimes treated his clients badly, I realized that some people would assume that this was probably the cause of these projects not getting constructed. So I decided I had to try to find out the reasons for each of the unbuilt projects. Now actually, when I mentioned to a couple of my friends who were practicing architects that only about one-third of Wright's Bay Area projects were constructed, they told me that this wasn't that unusual for many architects. But even so, I wanted to be able to answer the question. And I decided that I had to get access to the correspondence between Wright and the clients of all these projects. Correspondence that's mostly in the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright archives which used to be at Taliesin West in Arizona, but is now at the uh, Avery Library in New York. And with this correspondence, hundreds of letters and other documents, I was able to determine the reasons that each of these projects wasn't built. And it turns out that there were many different reasons, but surprisingly, almost none of them had to do with right treating the clients badly. This actually surprised me a bit. In a few cases, it was actually the clients who were difficult to deal with. And in some cases, the designs were so unusual that uh, construction would have been difficult or too expensive, as I mentioned in the case of um, that Seacliff design for the, uh, for the Morrises. Here we see that again. Or the client simply found the designs too strange to accept. And this was the case with a house that Wright designed in 1939 for a Mr. and Mrs. Smith in um, Piedmont Pines uh, in the East Bay. The site reminded Wright of the Lake Tahoe site where in the 1920s he had designed a group of buildings, here's one of them, um, that were never constructed, using a kind of Indian teepee shape. And he decided that this would be perfect for the Piedmont Pines uh, site that the Smiths had, which had a similar topography, he felt. But the Smiths apparently found the design too peculiar and got into uh, an argument with Wright. And this is, these are things I discovered by going through all of this correspondence between uh, Wright and the clients. So they had a, uh, a, a difficult uh, argumentative meeting and they refused to pay him the fee they owed him for the preliminary design, which uh, the correspondence reveals was only $240. It's amazing that, uh, and this was, but they wouldn't even pay him $240 for all the work he had done to, de to design this. Now this, this, by the way, was one of the uh, uh, very few cases I found of, a kind of an unpleasant situation between Wright and one of his Bay Area clients. And then a couple of cases, that um, uh, call building skyscraper and the butterfly bridge, there actually was no client. Uh, Wright simply did the design in the hope that it would uh, uh, get built. So that's another reason that uh, some of these projects didn't get built, that there wasn't actually cl a client. Um, and then there were some unexpected reasons why a um, building wasn't constructed. For example, a house that Wright designed in 1950 for a man named Robert Bush and his wife at Stanford. He was a young um, uh, a faculty member at Stanford, and, and they were, he and his wife were friends of the Hannas who had built the uh, Hanna House in the 1930s. Well, the Bushes found Wright to be very amiable, as uh, seen in their letters, and they loved the design that he produced for them, which uh, we see here, and were all ready to build it. But then there's a sad letter in the, uh, in the archive 
from Robert Bush to Wright, reporting that their daughter had been stricken with polio. And because of this and all the uh, medical expenses, they would have to forget about uh, building the house. But he added that, of course, they would pay the fee they still owed Wright uh, for the design as soon as they could. Well, as I was going through the correspondence, the next, uh, the next letter uh, was from Wright, uh, immediately writing back to, uh, um, to Robert Bush, expressing his sympathy for their daughter and saying, quote, don't worry about paying us. So uh, there's a, uh, uh, a story that um, sort of contradicts the, the stereotype of Wright as always being mean to his clients. Well, I have to say that reading the hundreds of letters between Wright and his Bay Area clients, most of which had never been looked at by scholars before, as far as I know, was one of the most uh, compelling and sometimes touching aspects of this uh, research project for me. And I decided to uh, include in the uh, book all of these stories of Wright's relationships with his uh, Bay Area clients. Well, another aspect of Wright's work in the uh, Bay Area is that San Francisco is the only place where he had a branch office. That is separate from Taliesin in Wisconsin and Taliesin West in Arizona. In 1951, when he started getting quite a lot of work in the Bay Area, he asked one of his former Taliesin apprentices, Aaron Green, to uh, be his associate in San Francisco. And here we see uh, uh, the two of them in a later um, photograph. And they opened an office on uh, Grant Avenue in uh, um, downtown San Francisco. And here's the, uh, here's the building. Uh, it's, uh, at, uh, the building is still there. It's at 319 Grant Avenue on the second floor. Wright uh, designed the office interior. And here we see his uh, uh, plan that he worked on with his, uh, with his notes on it. It was actually an ingenious design for the interior of this uh, office with uh, screen-like walls made of uh, redwood slats and translucent glass. Oops, again, I meant to use my light pointer rather than the advance. Here are these screen-like walls um, uh, set at uh, suggesting the hexagonal geometry, perhaps, of the uh, Hannah House, um, creating three spaces, the drafting room, a, um, uh, uh, an entrance area, and, the, and a private office, uh, but allowing, because this, uh, this had translucent glass, these screen-like walls, it allowed some um, natural light and also visual privacy in each of these three uh, spaces. So it was a very clever uh, design for a, a space that only had windows on one, um, on one side here, of course, looking out on, on Grant Avenue. It was a somewhat difficult uh, design problem. Um, and here we see what the office actually looked like. The private uh, office and uh, reception area at the top and then the drafting room below. Although we're not seeing it here in its original location on Grant Avenue. After Wright's death in 1959, Aaron Green continued to use the office, but then had to leave the building and he dismantled the, um, the office interior and was later installed in the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, where we see it here. But then in uh, th uh, this office interior has a strange uh, kind of uh, odyssey as a history, because in, 19, uh, in 2004 it was dismantled again and sold to a collector in Buffalo, New York. And it's been in storage there uh, ever since. And it's been a fond hope of, of mine to have it returned to San Francisco someday and in, installed somewhere here. Well, now I'm going to turn to another aspect of the story of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright in San Francisco, which is the various ways that he was covered in the local press. And to get this information, I spent countless hours here in the uh, newspaper archives in the public library up on the fifth floor, and also found material in the uh, history room on the, on the sixth floor. In the 1940s and 50s, the later part of Wright's career, the Bay Area newspapers covered him in basically two ways. 
On the one hand, there were stories about his projects in the Bay Area, as we would expect. Here we see on the left a full page article about his design for, uh, uh, for his butterfly bridge uh, to go across the San Francisco Bay. And um, uh, on the upper right there, a story about his hiring by Marin County to design the Civic Center, and an article about his uh, Daphne mortuary design. You can see that it's titled Death and Taxes, and this refers to uh, one of Wright's quips about the proximity of the mortuary to the mint, which is described in that little article. So that was one type of, of uh, newspaper coverage about Wright. Um, Wright, uh, I might j just mentioned that Wright had a distinctive and, and sometimes uh, wicked sense of humor. For example, he later r recalled that he had to visit, in, in connection with designing the, uh, the Daphne uh, mortuary complex, that he, he, he later said he had to uh, visit several other mortuaries with Mr. Daphne to learn about uh, what they required and the uh, programmatic requirements of designing mortuaries. And, and he said, quote, this nearly got me down. I would come back home wondering if I felt as well as I should. But Daphne had a way of referring to the deceased as the merchandise, and that would cheer me up. <laughs> but another kind of uh, press coverage during this period was about the often opinionated statements that Wright made in interviews and talks during his many visits to San Francisco. In uh, general, uh, Wright disliked American cities and the architecture in them, and he didn't spare the buildings in San Francisco, calling them, for example, shanty architecture, and saying uh, on one occasion, it's time you had another earthquake here. <laughs> Yet, otherwise, he liked the city. Perhaps it's the only American city that he did genuinely like. On one of his visits in 1944, he said uh, the following, <coughs> San Francisco is the most charming city in America and the most cosmopolitan and picturesque, but the most backward city architecturally. Yet it manages because of the character of its hills and environment and its people who are the best looking in the country. I, li I like that. And then he continues, I don't know how much of this is due to natural advantages or accident, but I like San Francisco. As far as I know, that's a, it's about the only city that, in America that he uh, ever said anything like that about, so positive. So in his, um, in his later years, it was Wright's designs as well as his opinions on things that were reported in the press, and also the various things he did while in San Francisco, such as a roundtable forum that he participated in in 1949 on modern art in which he uh, played the gadfly making uh, all sorts of controversial statements about contemporary art and society which got widely reported in the uh, local press. For example, he got into a couple of ar uh, big arguments in this forum with the uh, artist Marcel Duchamp, who was also on the panel. Here we see in one of the, uh, their sessions, here's Wright, and here's Marcel Duchamp down there, and they got into uh, some amazing uh, arguments, and I had to uh, get the transcripts of the, this whole, of these sessions uh, from the um, San Francisco Art Institute. Uh, and uh, at one point, in another one of the sessions, the one at the bottom here, and here we see right at the, at the end of this table here, um, he, um, one of the, uh, after Wright was uh, uh, making um, controversial statements, one of the other participants interrupted and said, what Mr. Wright is saying is sheer nonsense, which naturally did not sit well with uh, Wright, and things started going downhill from then on. But what's interesting is that um, the newspaper stories that San Franciscans first read about Wright many years earlier were very different from this. They had almost nothing to do with his architecture or his public statements, but with the scandals and tragedies in his personal life in the 1910s and 20s. In 1909, 
Wright had left his wife and family and gone to Europe with the wife of one of his former clients, a woman named Mama Borthwick Cheney. And when they returned in 1911, he built the first Taliesin in Wisconsin as their new home, mainly to get away from Chicago and to try to avoid the um, negative publicity about their relationship. And then in August 1914, there was this terrible event reported here in um, the uh, San Francisco Chronicle and Examiner, those two stories, in which um, Mama Borthwick and her two children were murdered along with four other people at uh, Taliesin, murdered by a, a servant who had apparently become deranged and the house was, uh, was partially burned down. The article here from the um, examiner the, the, on the, uh, up there, um, uh, the article the, the next morning says that three people were killed because it wasn't yet known that uh, seven had died. And more details of the tragedy kept uh, being reported day after day in the, in the San Francisco newspapers, along with the story of Wright's uh, relationship with Mama Borthwick, making him out to be a uh, uh, disreputable, or at least extremely unconventional uh, character. And for many years, virtually the only news about Wright in the San Francisco newspapers, and this is what I discovered by uh, really going through all of these uh, newspaper, uh, going working in the newspaper archives here in the library, uh, about the only news about Wright was about his, these personal problems of his. As he finally, uh, then in the succeeding years, divorced his first wife, married another woman, uh, Miriam Noel, then separated from her and met Olga Vanna Milanoff, who eventually became his third wife and actually contributed to the success of his career in several ways for the um, rest of his life. But in the 1920s, these personal problems involved all sorts of legal battles and disputes which the newspapers loved. There were times I found that like, day after day there would be uh, in the San Francisco newspapers in the early and mid 20s, there would be one story after another about Franklin Wright's problems or his, these women in his lives. It was like a long running uh, soap opera. And in 1927, there was a local angle to the story when Miriam Noel, uh, his estranged second wife, who had disappeared from uh, Chicago several months earlier, as, uh, as according to the press, was found hiding in San Francisco, as the papers said, in an apartment building at 925 Sutter Street on Lower Knob Hill, where she gave several sensational interviews to the papers attacking Wright and uh, Ol Gavana. Here we t see two of the stories from the, uh, from the Examiner. And then the one on the, uh, on the left here, here's uh, Miriam Noel and Wright, of course, and this is uh, Ol Gavana. Um, in, uh, in the first story in February, she was quoted as saying, I've been here in San Francisco for my health. This is uh, Miriam Noel was qu quoted as saying. The shock and publicity that followed my husband's devotion, devotion to Mata Milanoff was, has so completely undermined my health that I'm a nervous wreck. I came out here to recover and I've succeeded uh, wonderfully. California is wonderful. I've gained 30 pounds since I've been here, she said. She apparently liked San Francisco cuisine. Well, Miriam stayed here in San Francisco um, until September when her divorce from Wright was finally settled. The photograph on the right uh, shows her boarding a train for Los Angeles. And she was quoted as saying, I've had several offers from Hollywood and I'm going uh, uh, to drop in tomorrow and have some screen tests taken. I might stay and work in a picture and then I'll go on to Paris. I'm going to drown my sorrows in art. So what's interesting, I think, and the reason I bring this all up is that for many years, the general public heard mainly about these scandalous and sensational aspects of Wright's life. And it wasn't until later that newspapers began reporting on his architecture in a serious way. And this early focus on the um, scandalous or tragic aspects of his personal life colored the uh, public perception of Wright. 
to some extent for the rest of his uh, life, I think. Most books on Wright's architecture don't uh, uh, mention or tend to avoid these more sordid topics, but I decided that they were relevant to the larger question of how Wright and his architecture were perceived by the, by the general public. Next, let me mention a couple of Wright's buildings in the Bay Area that I haven't shown so far. First is one called the Bueller House in uh, Orinda of 1948. In most ways, it's typical of Wright's Usonian house type that uh, he was developing or had developed in the 1930s with uh, concrete slab floors and radiant heating and other features that made them uh, a somewhat less expensive prototype for middle-class suburban housing. But the Bueller house here has some unusual traits not usually found in the uh, Usonians, especially a, a large octagonal di uh, living room, uh, which we see uh, in this uh, photograph, with a sloping plane for a roof, not the normal way you'd think of roofing uh, an octagon, which creates a very uh, dramatic uh, interior space. It's a really uh, beautiful room. And a, uh, another house I want to show here, the Bassett House in Hillsborough, which has a hexagonal plan like the earlier Hannah House, though it's a completely different uh, plan and, um, and a smaller house. But one of the most interesting things about, um, about this house has to do with the people who lived here. First were the uh, Bassetts, uh, Sidney and Louise uh, Bassett, who uh, built it in 1940 and loved the house but only uh, lived in it for two or three years due to uh, personal problems. Then they rented it for, um, for uh, two or three years, and then it was bought by young refugees from Europe, Lewis and Betty Frank, who lived there for the rest of their lives and had Wright design a small addition to the house, so it's sometimes called the Bassett Frank House. But the person who rented the house in the early 1940s before the Franks bought it, was a man named Joseph Eichler, who at that time worked in his family's wholesale food business. But he got to love the house so much that he became interested in architecture and several years later bought a company that produced tract houses. But he wanted to create a better type of tract housing than uh, existed and he uh, hired the architect Robert Anshin, and then later some other architects, um, uh, who, uh, and, and Robert Anshin at first designed prototypes for um, Eichler that were simplified versions of Wright's Usonian houses. And here we see a very early uh, ad in the, from the Palo Alto Times uh, uh, for uh, advertising these Eichler homes, as they were uh, called, you can see the full price of it is $9,400. And, um, and this, this led to uh, a more fully developed designs for these Eichler homes, thousands of which, as you probably know, were built in the Bay Area and, uh, and elsewhere, but mainly in the Bay Area. And they were widely published and won architectural awards and had an important influence on uh, post-war suburban house design in America. And Eichler later um, uh, acknowledged fully the uh, influence uh, that, that Wright and the Bassett House had uh, had on him. He later said about living in the Bassett House for just that was two or three years, he said, it was, a, it was a revelation to me. I admired Wright's rich design and asked myself if such houses could be built for ordinary people. So one of Wright's Bay Area buildings had an unexpected and uh, significant effect on American suburban architecture. Well, now let's look more closely at the, uh, at the V.C. Morris shop on Maiden Lane here in the city. As I mentioned before, Wright was commissioned in 1944 to design a house for the Morrises, um, Lillian and V.C. He, he was always called V.C. Morris, and it took me a while to find uh, his full name. His, his full name was Veer Chase Morris, but for some reason he insisted on just being known as V.C. Morris, and that was the name of their shop. But, um, but before the, the shop was designed, 
uh, they had commissioned him to design their uh, house for their property at, uh, at Seacliff on Camino del Mar, and we uh, saw before this amazing design that, that he came up with. And for several years, they kept pursuing this house project, trying to get it to work and to be feasible, and Wright uh, uh, produced other designs for the site. We saw one of those before. And in the process, Wright and the Morrises became good friends. And there's a photograph I found of Wright and Lillian Morris at Stinson, Stinson Beach, where uh, they had some property and uh, they asked Wright to, uh, this was later in the 1950s, they asked him to design a, a beach house for them uh, at Stinson Beach, and he did. He designed that house, but which also was not built. For a very, there were other reasons why that one wasn't built. Uh, the, uh, Aaron Green, who, um, uh, who, who had worked on uh, these uh, uh, projects, uh, on the later projects for the Morrises with Wright, Aaron Green was later in an oral interview um, asked if Wright ever got discouraged because none of his uh, house projects for the Morrises was constructed. And he said, no. He liked the Morrises so much that he just kept trying. Then, in 1947, they mentioned to Wright that they were planning to remodel their shop on Maiden Lane. Their, they, uh, their shop was just in an undistinguished uh, uh, small uh, building on Maiden Lane. And um, much to their surprise, he offered to do the design for them. It was surprising because uh, Wright almost never took remodeling jobs. He considered it kind of beneath his dignity or that he wasn't, that, he, that they wouldn't give him an opportunity to do um, interesting enough uh, projects. But, but he accepted in this case. And I think the reason is that, um, uh, that I think it clearly had to do with the um, Guggenheim Museum in New York. Because beginning in about 1943, early, earlier in the 40s, Wright had been working on his design for the Guggenheim Museum, for, uh, for Solomon Guggenheim in New York. Here we see some of his, uh, his drawings as he was trying to uh, work out the design. And they, but the process kept dragging out uh, and kept being delayed, and it was, it was unclear whether it was really going to be built. And he was uh, exploring various ways of dealing with the concept of a spiral ramp as the basic form of this uh, uh, museum, this building. And it wasn't until the late 50s that the museum was actually constructed. So I think that Wright took on the Morris job in 1947 because he saw here an opportunity by completely de uh, redesigning the Morris' uh, shop to explore on a miniature scale the Guggenheim concept of a spiral ramp as the centerpiece of a building whose function was the display of objects. So in that sense, that the uh, programs were, were very similar. And here I have views of the, of the two buildings, the Guggenheim on the right, of course, and the V.C. Uh, Morris shop on the, um, on the left. And the Morris shop was constructed in 1949, long before the uh, Guggenheim got built. So there's this fascinating relationship between these two projects. And uh, with the uh, Morris shop, Wright, in a sense, uh, was um, doing a, a kind of small-scale tryout of, of the Guggenheim concept. And if we look at one of the, uh, look at a detail of one of Wright's uh, section drawings for the shop, we see that he was even thinking of uh, how to display some of the uh, Morris's merchandise on the uh, ramp itself in, in circular recesses in the, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the walls. And this is, in fact, how, how it was constructed and, uh, and used. Here we see uh, a photo of it uh, taken right after the construction of the shop, when it was still the V.C. Morris shop. Well, this uh, turned out to be one of Wright's own favorite buildings. And whenever he came to San Francisco, he would visit it. It was on his walk from the St. Francis Hotel, where he usually stayed, to his uh, office with Aaron Green on Grant Avenue. And Green later recounted how Wright would often enter the shop uh, and rearrange the merchandise. <laughs> As sort of typical of, of Wright. Um, here we just see another, another view of the, uh, 
of the interior right after its construction. Although Green added, uh, when he des uh, described how Wright would do this, he added, if I came back the next day, everything would be right back where it was before Mr. Wright had been there. And, um, and Wright's design for the exterior of the shop, though it may look rather plain at first, is also really an extraordinary design with a number of uh, subtle and unusual details. I might mention that the um, uh, shop has been uh, sold recently and it does not have a new tenant yet, so it's, it's closed now, so you can't go in the shop now, but of course you can go there and see this uh, exterior. Um, for example, uh, on the exterior here, the main surface is pulled out just slightly from the surrounding frame, and you can't see that too well here, but it's, it's, it's as if there's a kind of frame around it, and then the central part of it is, is pulled out. And, um, and the bold arched entryway there is emphasized by a series of recessed bands, as you can see. And on the left side is a column of removed bricks which are lit at night and have a, um, this is an uh, old photograph taken right after the construction of the building, and uh, have a counterpoint in a horizontal row, as you can see, of, uh, of lit squares at the base of the building. And here we see another uh, more recent view of that. And the, uh, but then there's an amazing detail, which is, um, is, is normally not pointed out, I think, in discussions of, uh, of uh, this building in the right literature. In the tunnel-like entrance there that you go in, uh, uh, through to enter the building, the, um, the, the vault in this tunnel-like entrance is brick on one side, and I, have, I think I have the next slide. Here, that shows that better, yeah. Is brick on one side, but glass on the other, which had never been done before, as far as I know. It was really somewhat un unprecedented, and shows that Wright was willing to violate uh, the conventional logic or rules of architectural logic in a way that most architects probably would not have dared to do. A vault, after all, should be made of a continuous material. So he's doing something very odd here. Um, and in th this and many other ways, this is really a remarkable building. In, in my opinion, it's one of Wright's most brilliant uh, designs, both inside and out. And as I say, the building has, uh, was recently sold and will have a new uh, commercial tenant. I've actually been working with the um, uh, San Francisco Planning Department and the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy, the main Frank Lloyd Wright organization, to try to ensure that the interior as well as the exterior is fully uh, protected and preserved. Well, finally, I'm going to say something more about Wright's amazing design for a bridge across the San Francisco Bay. Following World War II, there were calls to build a second bridge from San Francisco to Oakland to accommodate increased uh, traffic. This was, uh, of course, before the uh, BART tunnel was proposed. And a uh, structural engineer who lived in uh, Berkeley, Yaroslav Polivka, who had worked with Wright on a couple of his earlier projects, suggested that Wright produce uh, a design for this bridge, which he did in um, uh, 1949. It was a really unprecedented design, mostly consisting of precast concrete sections that reminded Wright of butterfly wings, so he called it the Butterfly Bridge. But the most dramatic part was the central section with two arches spanning uh, 1,000 feet, which we see in the upper uh, uh, drawing there, which uh, reportedly would have been the longest concrete uh, bridge span at that time. The, the two arches separating at the center, this was the, the unusual, uh, mo perhaps most unusual feature about this design. These arches separated in the center and supported a suspended landscape park. And oops, again, I'm ad advancing when I don't mean to. Um, here's the uh, central part of the bridge, and you can see how the, the roadway splits here, and, uh, so that there are two arches. Um, and then the, the idea was that one could pull, pull off into this landscape park 
and enjoy the views from uh, from above. And you can even see part of this park that's up in that uh, the drawing. A really amazing and kind of crazy idea, maybe, but uh, 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 certainly something that's never been done before. Well, Wright and Polivka promoted the design, and it received a lot of favorable uh, attention and pu uh, publicity. And here's that article that we saw before uh, from uh, the San Francisco Call newspaper. And uh, there's, it includes a, uh, a map showing where this was to be. This is the, the existing Bay Bridge, and this is where Wright's des design was to be, um, uh, running from uh, just about the end of Army Street over to uh, Alameda. But the state uh, agency in charge of such projects rejected the design as being too radical and uh, untested. Nevertheless, Wright continued to promote it over the next several years. And in 1953, he constructed an, imp an impressive model of the central section, which he presented at a large public event at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which at that time was in the uh, War Memorial Veterans Building at the, uh, in the Civic Center. The, uh, the model then stayed there and was seen by many more people, including groups of school children, as we can see here. Then the model was exhibited in uh, other places uh, in the San Francisco area, such as the Emporium Department Store. And in this photograph, we see, um, this is Aaron Green, but this is George Christopher, Mayor, Mayor Christopher, who was a, a big supporter of this uh, project. And then exhibited at the Stonestown Shopping Center, and here's here we see it uh, at Stonestown. Well, Wright's um, presentation of the design at, the, uh, at that uh, Civic Center event was widely reported in the uh, press. And let me read from the Chronicle's story about it, which gives an idea of the uh, enthusiasm the public had for Wright's works. It also gives an idea of the uh, exuberant and, and dramatic flair that, that Wright himself had in, in promoting these projects. I'll just show one another view that where we see the uh, the model as well as the as that um, uh, drawing, which was also on exhibit at this uh, event in the in the Civic Center, 1953. Well, here's the uh, this, here's part of the article that was in the uh, Chronicle about this event. Quote: Frank Lloyd Wright unveiled a model of his butterfly bridge for the San Francisco Bay last night with a flight of rhetoric as soaring as the bridge's great arches. He said, here is your bridge. Steal the sinews buried in the flesh, concrete. He's uh, describing um, reinforced concrete there. A bridge for all time, no upkeep ever needed. The, the, uh, and then going back to the, rep the, the article, the, um, the audience that jammed the San Francisco Museum of Art to see and touch the 16-foot model of the bridge was appropriately uplifted. The 535 seats in the main auditorium were sold out. Another 500 listeners applauded Wright's words in an overflow gallery, and an estimated 500 more sprawled on the marble floors with their ears cocked to amplifiers. Wright called his bridge, this concatenation, this wedding of two materials, an eternal bridge in which the water becomes with the bridge a great element of beauty. We can't go on building bridges that are the equivalent of poles and wires. He's referring to truss bridges and, uh, and suspension bridges, which he, he thought this would be a better type of bridge. And above all, we can't have this obstreperous interference in the name of science into the realm of beauty. He's, he's talking about the state engineers who rejected his design. <laughs> Mopping his brow with an enormous handkerchief, Wright said, you are citizens, all of you, aren't you? Divorce the bridge from politics. Stop worrying about Oakland. Get out and build it yourselves. He, he was a real showman. By the way, that, that reference to Oakland was because Wright's uh, design for this butterfly bridge had been received very enthusiastically in, in San Francisco, but a different site for, um, for the bridge was favored in the East Bay for various reasons. Well, in more recent years, Wright's Butterfly Bridge 
has been reproposed on uh, several occasions. For example, after the Loma Prieta earthquake of 1989, when um, the famous bridge designer T.Y. Lin examined the design, the Wright's design, and said he thought it was structurally feasible. And Jerry Brown, when he was uh, mayor of Oakland, said, it's a fantastic design. If we had this bridge leading into Oakland, it would be a major boon. People from all over the world would come to drive across it. So, so by then it was appreciated in uh, Oakland too. Like so many of uh, Wright's buildings and projects, this bridge looks as, a, as advanced and amazing today, I think, as when it was proposed more than uh, 50 years ago. And even longer ago in the case of other designs of uh, Wright's. For example, his uh, Seacliff House for the uh, Morrises more than 70 years ago. Or his radical hexagonal house for the Hannahs at Stanford 80 years ago. Or his call building skyscraper for Market Street more than 100 years ago. Well, I hope I've been able to uh, suggest the really remarkable qualities and diversity of Wright's Bay Area works and some of the fascinating aspects of his relationship with San Francisco. Thank you.